Welcome to Witch Hunt. I'm Mary Bingham. In this entry, I will recite and tell the story of the pretrial examination of John Willard as recorded by Samuel Paris, May 18th, 1692. Soon after John Willard was brought before the court, the afflicted, the most miserable fits upon his, this examinant drawing near. After several of them were recovered, he, John Willard, looked upon them and they again fell into fits, whilst the warrant and return were reading. The warrant dated May 15th was read aloud as follows. To the constable of County of Essex or to the constables in Salem or any other marshal or marshals, constable or constables within this their majesty's colony or territory of the Massachusetts in New England. As it's clearly stated, Willard was wanted and every law enforcement officer was either on the hunt or on the lookout for him because he fled to the Nashua, today Lancaster, after this first warrant was issued earlier in the month. According to the magistrates, fleeing was seen as an admission of guilt. So the warrant actually read, you are, in their majesty's names, are hereby required to apprehend John Willard of Salem Village, husbandman, if he be found in your precincts, and who stands charged with sundry acts of witchcraft by him done or committed on the bodies of Bray Wilkins and Daniel Wilkins, the son of Henry Wilkins of Salem Village, and others according to a complaint made before us by John Fuller Jr. and Benjamin Wilkins Sr., both of Salem Village aforesaid, who being found you are to convey from town to town, from constable to constable, until he be brought before us, or such as may be in authority there and here of you are not to fail, dated Salem, May 15th, 1692. Bray and Anna Wilkins were the grandparents of John's wife, Margaret, through their son, Thomas. Daniel Wilkins was Margaret's cousin. The magistrate turned his attention to John Willard at the bar. Here is a return of the warrants that you were fled from authority. That is an acknowledgment of guilt. But yet, notwithstanding, we require you to confess the truth in this matter. So the return that the magistrates possibly put before John Willard read as follows. I have apprehended John Willard of Salem Village according to the tenor of this warrant and brought him before your worships, dated the 18th of May, 1692, by me, John Putnam, Constable of Salem. John Willard and John Putnam were both sworn as constables of Salem in 1692, John Willard's official title being Deputy Constable, meaning he was responsible for apprehending the accused and bringing them safely before the magistrates at an appointed time stated in the arrest warrant. So they obviously knew each other. The most interesting take I have heard on the possible encounter between the two men when Putnam finally located Willard on his farm at current day Lancaster, Massachusetts, creates an imaginative scene in their program, Salem, the podcast, the episode titled The Twisted Tale of John Willard, Sarah Black imagines that John Putnam possibly entered Willard's property and stood quietly. Willard set his sight on him as Putnam gestured for Willard to come forward. Maybe Willard said, you coming for me? Then Willard just slept his hoe in the field and went with Putnam. It's interesting to imagine that scene no matter what happened. But we do know that John Willard was safely delivered to the watch house at Salem Village near Nathaniel Ingersoll's Tavern as he awaited his examination. John Willard goes on to say at his examination, I shall, as I hope, I shall be assisted by the Lord of heaven. And for my going away, I was affrighted. And I thought by my withdrawing, it might be better. I fear not, but the Lord in his due time will make me as white as snow. The magistrate asked, What do you say? Why do you hurt these? John responded, I know nothing about appearance. He is speaking of his specter as his appearance. The magistrate looks at the afflicted and asked, Is this the man? Several responded, Yes. 
He turned back to John and said, they charge you. It is you or your appearance. I know nothing of appearance and the God of heaven will clear me, declared John. Willard doesn't cave. His specter isn't doing anything to anyone. The magistrate continued, they charge you not only with this, but with dreadful murders, and I doubt not if you be guilty, God will not want evidence. So the murder in which the magistrate spoke was the alleged murder of 16-year-old Daniel Wilkins, a cousin to Margaret Willard, John's wife. George Herrick was present when John Putnam arrived near the watch house at Salem Village carrying John Willard. Ezekiel Cheever arrived and gave the marshal a note on behalf of the Wilkins family and friends to examine Daniel's body. It was signed by 11 people who deemed his death as unnatural caused by, and I quote, some witchcraft or diabolical act. Elizabeth Hubbard said that John afflicted her and the testimony of Mercy Lewis was read aloud. The magistrate turned to John and said, if you desire mercy from God, then you must confess and give glory to God. John replied, Sir, to my sins I am guilty of. If the minister asks me, I am ready to confess. The magistrate responded, If you have revolted from God, you are a dreadful sinner. And Willard then bit his lip. Mary Warren cried out, Oh, she bites me. Anne Putnam cried out, Much of him. The magistrate said, open your mouth and don't bite your lip. To which John responded, I will stand with my mouth open or I will keep it shut. I will stand anyhow if you tell me how. After Ann Putnam's evidence was read, they asked Willard if he heard this evidence read, to which he replied, yes, I do hear it. Then Susanna Sheldon's testimony was read and the magistrate asked, what do you say to this murdering and bewitching your relations? John responded, One would think that no creature except they belong to hell from their cradle would be guilty of such things. The magistrate continued, You say you will bewitch your grandfather because he prays that the kingdom of Satan may be thrown down. Willard started a long explanation to which the magistrate probably held up his hand and cut Willard short, saying, We do not send for you to preach. In addition to being accused of murdering Daniel Wilkins, John was accused of bewitching his grandfather-in-law, Bray Wilkins. John Willard may not have been fully accepted into the Wilkins family because he was the first person from outside Salem Village to marry into the tightly woven Wilkins crew. Though his origins can't be stated with certainty, it is likely John was close kin to Samuel Willard Sr., who lived in the Groton and Concord area. John made land deals with other Willards who lived in that area before moving to Salem Village and marrying Margaret Wilkins in 1687. John had his heart set on going with the Wilkins to Boston for Election Day on May 4th in 1692. In fact, he invited Henry Wilkins, uncle to Margaret, to go with him. After Henry accepted the invitation and John left, the usually reserved Daniel, who was still alive at that time, suddenly exclaimed, Willard ought to be hanged. The following day, the family was at Boston, where they gathered at the home of Lieutenant Richard Way. Henry Wilkins and John Willard arrived slightly after the others, and upon entry, Bray believed John gave him a different kind of a look, which Bray believed to may have been the evil eye. Bray told Anna, his wife, that John was responsible for the illness suddenly brought on after that strange look. Bray told the woman the family sent to treat him that an evil person had damaged him. However, he probably suffered some type of blockage which caused great stomach discomfort, along with a possible urinary tract infection. Benjamin Wilkins was called forward and told the magistrates, for all his natural affections, he abused his wife much and broke sticks about her in beating her. And John responded, there are a great many lies being told. I could desire my wife might be called. 
It's not known whether or not Margaret was in the meeting house that day, but she was neither sent for nor called forward as requested by her husband. Instead, Peter Prescott was called forward, who backed Benjamin Wilkins' claims when he said he, meaning John, with his own mouth, told me of his beating his wife. The magistrate turned to John and said, it seems very much one of your confidence and ability to speak should be no more courageous than to run away. By your running away, you tell all that you are afraid. John then asked his neighbor, Aaron Way, to speak on his behalf. John's jaw must have hit the floor when Aaron faced the magistrates. You see, Aaron told the magistrates, if I must speak, I will. I can say you have been very cruel to poor creatures. The magistrates suggested the touch test and invited Aaron Putnam to go first. And John basically said, someone else, please. If the afflicted who was touched did not come out of their affliction, it was believed the accused person was not guilty. If the person who was afflicted came out of their fit, the accused person was believed to be guilty. So Susanna Sheldon and Mary Warren went to him in that order while John Indian shouted, Oh, he cuts me. Susanna tried to approach John, but she fell. She continued to cry out, Oh, John Willard, John Willard, as he grabbed on tight to her hand. By the Puritan belief, Willard should have been immediately let off the hook, but he wasn't. Once she was able to speak again, the magistrate asked Susanna what prevented her from going near Willard. Her reply was, the black man stood between us. Willard stepped in and said, they cannot come near any that are accused. The magistrate retorted that Nehemiah Abbott was able to talk to the afflicted at his examination. So the constables firmly came forward and held Willard's hands when Mary Warren was seized with fits and carried to him, then soon became well after she was touched. Willard then asked, why was it not before with Susanna Sheldon? The bystanders responded that his hands were not clasped at that time. And according to author Marilyn Roach, the constables agreed that forgetting that Susanna reported seeing a quote-unquote black man. Then most everyone who testified alleged to have seen those who were murdered by Willard hanging around him. The magistrate asked, do you think these are bewitched? To which he responded, yes, I verily believe it. They continued, well, others they have accused it is found true on and why should it be false in you? Willard doesn't get a chance to answer the question because Mary and Susanna screamed that a specter came forward and started to afflict them. The magistrate asked John, what do you think of it? How comes this to pass? He responded, it is not me. I know nothing of it. The badgering continued when John continued to respond such as, sir, I cannot confess that I do not know. And... I am as innocent as the child that is now to be born. Then the magistrate asked if John could recite the Lord's Prayer. He tried many times and failed many times. He got so flustered that he blamed the afflicted for his inability to recite the prayer. So it was believed that a witch could not recite the Lord's Prayer without difficulty. And when Willard kept on making mistakes, the magistrate said, Say that you will confess. And John Willard shot back. I am as innocent as the unborn child. The magistrate asked, Do not you see God will not suffer you to pray to him? Are not you sensible of it? Willard answered, Why, it is a strange thing. The magistrate responded, No, it is not a strange thing that God will not suffer a wizard to pray to him. Then they continue to warn Willard that he's also accused of murder and he should just confess already. Finally, John Willard declared, if it was the last time I was to speak, I am innocent. 
John Willard was hanged August 19, 1692. Margaret Willard's actions after his death tend to dispel the rumor that her husband badly beat her. According to the research of Rachel Christone and Jill Christensen at the Salem Witch Museum, I will quote their website, which is linked in the show notes. In September of 1710, a committee was established to formally consider the claims for restitution by the survivors and loved ones of those impacted by the Salem witch trials. In her petition, Margaret spoke of the damage done to her husband, causing him to suffer death for such a piece of wickedness as I, Margaret, have not the least reason in the world that he is guilty of. On October 17, 1711, the Massachusetts legislature approved the reversal of the attainder of 12 of those individuals who were executed and seven of those who were condemned but not executed in the year 1692. With this act, John Willard's name was legally cleared of all charges nearly 20 years after his death. Margaret married into the town family, Edmund's son, William, to be precise, nephew to Rebecca Nurse, Sarah Cloyce, and Mary Esty. Thank you.